thank you, Pratt Institute, for uh, the invitation. <coughs> I'm uh, speaking to you from Dublin in Ireland, which uh, we're coming up to 20 to 6 in the evening. So <coughs> I should just get my talk finished before I can add my pint to Guinness. Um, and uh, I'm going to kind of, and a lot of what Carl has said, um, I'm going to reiterate because in Europe, <coughs> we're very lucky, and I certainly realize this, that through the EU, we have a, a very large pot of money available to us for research. And we're, we certainly try to um, avail of that. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yep. Not yet. Oh, um, let me. Does that work? No. Let me just come out of that. Um, Still not seeing it, Peter. Okay, sorry. Um, There you go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I think I can probably um, pip Carl by a couple of years on uh, the oldest person in the room. Um, <laughs> and technology doesn't suit me that much, but we're learning and uh, we're certainly do that, doing that. Um, I come from a materials background. Um, chemical engineering and, and uh, material science. And I've worked in the area of uh, conservation or preservation of historic buildings uh, over ooh, too long, 35 years or thereabouts. And <clears throat> I'm going to run you through some of the work that we do and um, we're lucky enough to work on. And uh, I think as you gathered from Carl, and you will from Laurie that we're all passionate about this um, and we hope we can make a difference. Um, but that's up to you guys, the, the younger generation coming through to take our words and uh, hopefully um, in, in, incorporate some. The, the word carrig is the Irish word for rock and we started out uh, in, in our uh, journey in 1993 as building fabric consultants. Um, I had worked for a number of manufacturing companies and um, without naming names, um, a lot of them were uh, there to sell their products and wasn't necessarily the right thing for the job or for um, the, uh, the building. And I decided that there was a, a gap in the market for a kind of technical science-led um, building fabric consultants that could advise architects, engineers, building owners, building managers, and state parties um, on a, a completely independent basis. So we've no ties to anybody. That was kind of the first 25 years of our business, and it's still probably just about 50% of our annual turnover. But some through the organization ICOMOS, or ICOMOS is the International Council of Monuments and Sites. And <clears throat> I got fingered uh, at, a, at a particular meeting to lead a work group looking at um, energy efficiency in our kind of older heritage and traditional buildings. And this came about in 2010 uh, because in 2009, the EU signed a new directive looking at reducing energy in our built environment. And most of the preservation society were worried that this would have a detrimental effect on our buildings. And in fact, it does if, if you don't take care and do it right. So um, I led that group for nine years uh, as an international scientific committee under the ICOMOS banner. But I realized that there is a big gap in the market for this. So we now have a whole uh, division of our company called Carrig Energy um, kind of conservation. And so we can advise on that. 
<clears throat> and then the APT um, kindly invited me, I think it was 2013, to uh, talk at their annual conference in New York City. And it was the first time that they recognized that there should be a session uh, on energy efficiency. And they invited a number of people. And one of those other people was uh, an American um, young graduate called Caroline Engel. And she was doing a, a, a PhD in Edinburgh in Scotland. But she told me over dinner that she had met an Irish guy and she would be coming to Dublin at some stage. So um, we, a very uh, friendly nation, said, of course, drop in and say hello. Well, Caroline dropped in about three years later and we sat down and talked and we made our first bid on a research project and we won it. And so Caroline is now head of our research and married the Irish guy. So all, all ends well. Um, <clears throat> so we have three main divisions of our, of our company and I'm going to cover a lot of uh, the energy and research side, not so much the building fabric side. Um, this is a rock <clears throat> out in the mid middle of, a, well, not the middle, but 15 kilometers off the west coast of Ireland. A lot of you younger people would probably recognize it from Star Wars or something like that. We're still seething about that because our Minister for Heritage uh, allowed them film on this uh, World Heritage site for nothing, no money whatsoever. And our state has paid over 4 million euros trying to stop landslides and things that's happened, um, mainly because of helicopter action and things like that. And also we now are faced with all these, um, I, I'm not familiar with, with the program, but dark raiders or whatever you call them coming to visit the, the island, um, which we had to close last year. Um, and that gave us a breathing space. It's got a, it's got a, a, a religious uh, kind of monks arrived from France in the year 536. So these buildings are 1500 years old, um, built like beehives, uh, built of local stone cut out of the mountain. And, you know, a number of, of, of monks lived on this for, probably uh, six centuries. The, the next we know is they moved to the mainland and built an ecclesiastical site there. But they are amazing buildings. And well, we've worked on some of the materials analysis on this when we found that they had, had actually slaked lime, which is pretty phenomenal for the sixth century. And uh, they use grasses as a, a reinforcing uh, in, in the mortars. And we did a lot of analysis on that. That's all kind of published in, in the, um, the main uh, report of, of the World Heritage Site. Um, now we're back, um, what, uh, 95, so about 25, 30 years later. And we are at this moment doing a climate risk assessment on this island because uh, sea level rise, coastal erosion, but also access to the island um, is, is becoming very, very difficult. And as I say, it's one of our World Heritage sites, so it's a very important site. This is, um, you know, early 20th century, 1956 to be in fact, and it's a massive housing estate in Sheffield in England. And <clears throat> in the late 80s, there was an awful lot of social unrest and the Sheffield City Council cleared this of 1,100 families living in this um, kind of, we call it the spider. Um, and <clears throat> it was designed by the city architect at the time. It was pretty impressive uh, building. But um, in 1999, uh, Sheffield City Council signed a demolition order and the kind of crane and ball and chain was just setting up on site when um, English Heritage marched in and spot listed the building and said, you can't demolish it, you've got to keep it. Um, they didn't know what to do, uh, but a very exciting um, developer came on board and we started work on that in about 2003, um, where we surveyed the building, <coughs> taking 
uh, recognition of concrete corrosion and uh, decay and marked. Now, obviously, it's a huge building, so we didn't do every square inch on it, but um, what we decided to do was take worst case, best case, and, and medium case, uh, and then extrapolate that around. Um, in 2007, we uh, completed the first phase of the reuse, adaptive reuse of this building. Ground floor became retail and, and uh, kind of uh, gyms and things like that, and bars and restaurants. Um, and the rest of the building became a, 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 a division of um, some social, some affordable, and then some market priced uh, apartments. And it, it's been extremely successful. Unfortunately, the recession stopped phase two, but we're now back uh, on site actually doing that. This is a, an 1840s uh, lighthouse actually on Skellig Michael, the, the um, island I showed you. But of course, the, the, um, the lighthouse is now electronically or, or uh, kind of controlled from somewhere else and the buildings are, are, are in disuse. And we're actually doing an upgrade on these now to create a safe uh, working place for workers on the island, but also for visitors, for a small visitor centre, interpreter centre and some uh, obviously toilets. Um, and this is going to be a, a, an energy efficient uh, because you can't get uh, fossil fuels out there anyway. We're, we're using a, a mixture of wind, wind and solar. Um, <clears throat> talking about uh, uh, energy stations, uh, Carl showed that lovely building. And we were involved on the Tate Modern, which is in London. And the original building uh, um, designed by Scott um, was, is, is <clears throat> again dating from about um, 1953 or thereabouts and it um, was closed in 1976 because it was polluting the city of London and particularly St Paul's Cathedral and it closed and in, in the year 2000 um, the government took it over and they raised funds or gave funds and we've turned it into the uh, Tate Modern. The architect was uh, Swiss, uh, um, uh, de Muron, and um, it's an absolute amazing. And I still, I never tire of going to see it whenever I'm in London because it's just a spectacular. We then got involved in, in, in about 2015 when they, it was so successful, they needed an extension and Herzog and de Muron again designed this modern um, kind of uh, extension to it in a pretty weird shape but uh, we did all the analysis for them on how the brick was going to perform and how to uh, actually get it to a reasonable um, energy efficiency not, not carbon efficiency unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> most of our research uh, at the moment in, is in products related to uh, bringing up traditional or heritage buildings to a good uh, performance level. But with more natural products or at least products that aren't going to do damage to the fabric of historic buildings. This is a monastery in Germany and um, it, it was um, the Benedictines. And when I first went to, to visit this in about 20, I think it was 2012 or 2013, there was about eight um, kind of monks wandering around this whole complex, which was designed in the 1720s um, to house about 2000 uh, religious and 1000 lay people. So it's like a small village or a, or a town. Um, <clears throat> and what happened was the Benedictines gave it to the German state the German state gave this building that circled, circled there, which is the um, cooperage uh, to the Fraunhofer Institute of Building Physics. And together uh, with a group of people, um, we decided that we'd like to create a live laboratory so that we would restore this building and develop a number of rooms in with different products, different systems, uh, different mechanisms to um, measure. Uh, and we, we do measure. The one beauty of working with the likes of the Fraunhofer is that they have 
a lot of money and they can buy every widget you want to put in here, which is great for kind of uh, toys for boys like me anyway. <laughs> it's good fun. But the external, as you see from the previous photograph, the lime uh, render on this was pretty shot and, and ignored and kind of not cared for. And it's about 40, 40 mil, 45 millimeters thick. And we took off uh, the original uh, lime render and we've replaced it with a series of different renders with insulated properties. And um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this wall um, we did with lime and aerogel, which is a relatively kind of new product, um, which has been developed uh, for Na by NASA, I think, actually, for the state. The next one to it, we used lime render and cork. The front one, we, lose, we used lime render and hemp. And then the fifth one on the other side, we just did lime render on its own so that we could monitor. And within these um, kind of zones of walls, we put all sorts of monitoring equipment to monitor moisture movement, um, dew point, to um, you know, kind of temperatures, external temperatures, internal, and what I what we can report, and this this is now running for about four years, and the the ordinary lime render, believe it or not, improved the U value of this wall, which was about six hundred millimeters thick, uh, single uh, masonry construction, and. It improved the, the thermal efficiency of that wall by about 10%. The hemp and the cork pre, kind of really perform very similarly, about 33, 35% improvement. But the aerogel gives us about 74% uh, improvement. So even within these traditional walls, by not changing the profile um, of external, like we see an awful lot over here where people just stick polyurethane or polystyrene uh, insulation on the outside and then put another render on the outside of that, and make, making a, a kind of a cement sandwich, if you like. And that does not perform at all, whereas this, these natural products allow moisture movement um, and doesn't um, seal the building per se, but it makes it much, much, much more efficient from an external fabric point of view. That's the one with aerogel. Um, and inside we used again a number of different insulation products, all natural. And then um, I think you might call it drywall in the States. Um, we call it plasterboard over here, but it's a gypsum product and we don't like that. It doesn't allow any moisture. It creates condensation. Whereas all these panels are made from, again, lime, uh, calcium, basically, and they do allow a certain amount of, of breathing, but they also add um, a thermal efficiency to them. And as you can see, these are the widgets that we enjoy playing with. And we take basically readings in every room every 15 minutes. And, um, and it, it's proving to be really good. We've even started looking at adding perhaps aerogel to paint systems, which could then give us again another. But they're all breathable. They're all um, what we call open pore um, structures or materials. So that's really important. Some of the products that we're testing are wood fiber board, which is becoming really, really popular and very, very successful over here. Uh, instead of using polyurethane which are, and polystyrene, which are very high carbon to produce and even worse to, to recycle. You can't really recycle them and then you've got to dump them. Um, and this is a, an, another natural board, uh, actually compressed sheep's wool. Um, and this is the calcium board that we're, we're using in, in testing as well. We've also tested a number of different heating systems, uh, mostly electric. Uh, the beauty about this site as well is there's a lot of land. So we've been able to put in a, a, a mini um, PV farm to, to generate a lot of the electricity. For the bigger complex, uh, we, we've actually put in a, a kind of a biomass um, 
because this also is rural, so there's a lot of naturally fallen trees. And, uh, so we're, we're producing a lot of the um, energy for the whole complex on biomass, and we import some of that to this particular building itself. And then um, Aerogel are also now making this blanket, which is about eight millimeters thick, and it gives phenomenal. Um, now, at the moment, it's expensive, but I, the analogy I give is when I uh, got my first mobile phone in 1987, it was like a briefcase and uh, it cost about 3,000 pounds at the time, <laughs> whereas now you can buy them for, for 10, 10 euros or whatever. And um, so this is a product of the future. It, it's now being manufactured both in Germany and in the States. And um, we see this as a, as a very, very effective. And it also, it's, it's open pore, so it allows moisture, a certain amount of moisture through and evaporates and doesn't entrap. Because one of the biggest problems in what we call maladaptation is if you have a breathable um, wall um, of masonry that allows moisture through lime, everything else through. If you put a barrier on that, like a membrane or indeed some of these polystyrene polyurethane that has foil back even, and you're just trapping the moisture within the original fabric and that creates major problems for the fabric. But it also then relates to creating condensation, creating mold growth, on the interior of buildings and um, giving health problems to the occupants. These are some of the companies that we're working with to tweak products, to develop uh, kind of their, their products further to, to be suitable for um, energy efficiency in traditional and, and heritage buildings. We're also using it as a kind of an education center, if you like. Um, now, COVID kind of put a bit of a stop on this, but um, I'm pleased to say I'm going back in May and we're having a major conference there in the first week of May uh, co called EETB, which is the uh, Energy Efficiency in Traditional Buildings. It's been hosted here, um, but we're, we have four pillars really, uh, research, demonstration, collecting knowledge and training. And we want to start using this as a major training center for Europe. We also do an awful lot of work with um, Historic Environment Scotland. Again, they're well funded, they're well um, kind of set up for testing. And <clears throat> when, when, when the um, kind of new legislation came in, they produced and, uh, a, a form filling exercise to rate your building from an energy point of view. Some countries call it BER, Building Energy Rating. Others call it EPC, uh, which is Energy Performance Certificate. And what they were doing was because they were aiming at more modern buildings post 1970s, really, um, they gave uh, traditional or older buildings a default value. Uh, and I apologize, I, I don't know the conversion of, of or value to U value, but um, we this is a very common construction in Scotland and Ireland and England, uh, which is a solid masonry wall. It can be sandstone, limestone, granite, uh, it can be brick, um, and then usually has, has a lime uh, finish on the inside and outside, uh, although sometimes it's exposed outside. And it's usually between 450 millimeter thick and 500. And when we made this in a laboratory and tested it, when you have roughly 60, 40, 60% um, stone, 40% lime mortar, this wall will perform at about 0.9 U value. The default that all these form filling gives it is 2.2 U value. So you're starting off at the wrong point and and that means if you're taking this as 2.2 you have to put 300 mil uh, insulation on it whereas you actually don't um a, a 20 or a 40 mil insulation would bring this down to 0.75 which is is what is in our building regulations so there's a great lack of knowledge uh, in our older buildings we um when I mentioned Caroline Engel, the job, first job that we got was to um, 
to write a gap analysis on deep energy retrofitting uh, uh, renovation of traditional buildings, but looking at gaps and skills and training in Ireland. And this was funded by the Irish Heritage Council. And, um, and we, we produced a phenomenal document. And I, I, I'm sorry, I, as I said, I'm not too uh, computer literate, so I can't stick up um, things on, on the chat box, but I'll send some links to Deborah uh, after the talk and um, she can maybe circulate it to the people that attended. But this led to, um, there was definitely a gap in training. So we suggested that um, in conjunction with the Heritage Council, but funded by our SEAI, Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, which is a government department, uh, that we uh, produce a continual professional development, CPD, um, for um, 10, 10 modules, basically. And we did this, and luckily we did it in 2019 and uh, finished in January 2020 before COVID. So we did it uh, in, in person. And these were kind of three or the 10 headings that, that we felt important, uh, understanding your building uh, and, and looking at climate change and mitigation adaptation, introduction of traditional buildings and conservation principles, thermal efficiency and moisture management, upgrading building services and integrating renewable energy sources, and then looking at low risk, high impact energy renovation works. Uh, we went into a big, deal on solid wall insulation, as I've just explained, and then complying with building regulations and taking a balance, balanced approach. And I think, you know, building regs need to change more regularly um, to, to suit these new findings. And then looking at project coordination and risk, ma risk management, reducing the energy performance gap, and then dealing with knowledge gaps and uncertainty. We based uh, running this with 60 people. Um, we launched it and within two days, we had 120 people signed up. And in fact, we couldn't house everybody because we then ended up with 100 people actually attending because that's all the room would take. Uh, and we have a 70 uh, person kind of wait list. We're now looking at the pot potential of doing this as a virtual, a training program um, which we're seeking funding for at the moment. The other one that I was lucky enough uh, through ICOMOS to, to get involved in was writing a European guideline for deep retrofit and historically architecturally and culturally important buildings. Bit of a mouthful, but um, it's, uh, it's now a standard within the U EU and this is the kind of matrix that we came up with uh, which kind of says, if if you can't do this and this, then stop. Um, don't do it because you just you know think you can do it. So um, it's it's it is available uh, through uh, CEN, the Central European Standards. Um, I spent three years as part of the group to write this, and I have to pay 190 euros if I want to buy it, <laughs> which. Uh, but luckily I kept a copy before I sent it all off. Um, but it's a, an excellent document, but it's, 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 it's kind of, it's a procedure rather than a, a prescribed a, approach to it. Because um, years ago, I, I used a slide in, in one of my talks, which showed a, a thumbprint. And um, my caption was that every building is like fingerprints, no two are the same. Uh, even though they might be built at the same time, built the same, they're not maintained right, uh, they'll perform completely different. We did a fairly major study in 2019, again, for um, Historic England, who funded this, this project, and it was really looking at understanding carbon in the built environment. And a bit like um, Carl's kind of study when he showed his graphs, we looked at a number of case studies and what we did was we, we, we looked at the carbon footprint of it as it is today, including fossil fuel uh, operational energy. We then did a light energy upgrade and we met, we kind of uh, put in obviously heat pumps or you know, more renewable sources. And of course the operational energy came down greatly, but 
because of the products that were available to upgrade the fabric, we increased the footprint very marginally. And we found that um, it, it would take about four to five years to pay back that increase. In, in, uh, and from a cost point of view, it was only costing about 5% uh, more than doing the wrong thing. So from a cost point of view, it's very important. And then what we did was we took the same building and we, we did a deep energy retrofit, um, which was chucking everything at it. And um, we found that that increased the carbon more, um, uh, of, uh, particularly with new products going into it and uh, renovations. And that was going to take about 12 to 15 years to pay back. And then we um, virtually demolished the building dumped it on a dump site and built a new building to the volume to the same size, footprint, everything with new construction and with low technology, uh, low energy technology. And in that one, we found actually it takes 63 years to pay back the carbon uh, on that. So it's a no brainer. And this is now leading into discussions across Europe, um, even though Britain, isn't in Europe anymore, but I won't get into politics at the moment. Um, but <clears throat> the, um, the EU is seriously looking at a carbon fine for demolition and a carbon credit for buildings older than 60 years um, so that it'll change the economics of, of what we do with our buildings. Sorry. Um, this is a, a, an 1880s building built by the Guinness uh, family, which was originally for the workers in the Guinness factory, um, later to be turned into the Ivy Trust because Lord Ivy owned Guinnesses at the time. And um, they uh, converted all this into social housing. And it's now under the care of Dublin City Council. And about three years ago, we did a fairly major uh, but simple light green effect to make these more efficient. We put in central um, kind of heat pumps rather than individual. And we, we brought the carbon footprint of this block of apartments or um, down to, to about 48% less than what it was using. It's, it's not good enough, probably, but then if you measure the carbon that was saved in the reuse of this building rather than demolishing it and building a new one, then we're way ahead. And that's certainly uh, a passion of mine is adaptive reuse. Um, this is uh, the red brick in the middle is uh, dating actually from 1690. And it's a residential block in Trinity College, Dublin. And that's the campus that you're seeing around it. And <clears throat> this has been the longest um, building in residential use in, in Ireland um, since 1690 and it still was used up to recently. We're now doing a major conservation and energy upgrade of this building and we're going to get it to what we call a B2 which is a really really good energy performance um, and we're doing that by you know simple measures but effective measures. Um, we're, we're putting in geothermal uh, on uh, you can't see it there but uh, just off to the right there's a new building and they've agreed to put a whole bank of uh, pv panels on the new building um, to feed uh, energy into the older building so again it's this kind of uh, ho holistic approach really that we all need and um, other documents that we've been involved in writing, the climate change sectoral adaptation plan for built and archaeological heritage for the Irish government, and that's now in law. And um, this was a national adaptation framework, which we're now delivering um, for the Irish government. In, in, and again, they've, they've managed to, to um, fund this, which is fantastic. Um, Another study working with well, Peter. Uh, th this is Carl. I, I want to make sure that we're leaving Laurie uh, enough time here. Okay, so sure. why, why don't we uh, why don't we uh, bring it to a close here? Okay. I know okay. that uh, okay. a lot more to go through. Yeah. No, I don't have much actually. Um, 
And um, just that we've got three more studies uh, looking at, and this again, this is going to fund and make general information available. Um, so this is uh, a church that was derelict, burnt down. Uh, this is what it is now, adaptive reuse uh, for offices. Um, and um, that, that's it really. Um, I'd like to mention the Climate Heritage Network because I think it's a super and we're all members of it. And so thank you very much.